sociedad seguir ignorando o considerando ajenos los conflictos de ter territoriales de soberanía que se suscitan en estos pueblos y naciones en Estado. Es un problema, como ya se ha dicho y se seguirá diciendo en estos días, también europeo. No hay más que ver la evolución de muchas de estas situaciones en la última década. Por ejemplo, el movimiento social y político de los pueblos de Escocia y Cataluña, refrendando ya una prolongada mayoría política en sus parlamentos y gobiernos en los últimos años. ¿no? O los avances en Irlanda del Norte y el País Vasco tras conseguir la paz, tras el logro de la paz en sus conflictos. O, por ejemplo, el ascenso de los nacionalistas al gobierno en Córcega. O también podríamos citar la revitalización del nacionalismo gallego o el aumento de la voluntad independentista en el pueblo de Gales. Todos estos casos demuestran, en nuestra opinión, cómo en la actualidad ya no se trata tan solo de defender la identidad cultural y garantizar el derecho de nuestras lenguas. Se está reclamando también una mejor representación en las instituciones europeas y se exigen a sí mismo derechos sociales, soberanía política y plena capacidad de decisión sobre los recursos y la economía para el desarrollo de políticas de mayor bienestar e igualdad social en todas nuestras naciones. Por todo ello, y para hablar de la vitalidad social, de la reivindicación de la soberanía en las naciones sin Estado, queremos presentar en el debate, en el debate de hoy algunas voces representativas. En primer lugar, eh, presentaremos a quien nos puede ilustrar sobre la desigualdad en el reconocimiento legal de las lenguas y la desigualdad también de los derechos lingüísticos de sus hablantes. Será David Hicks, de la Red Europea por la Igualdad de las Lenguas. Tendremos a continuación a un excelente representante del avance de la igualdad y el empoderamiento de las mujeres, también en la defensa del cambio social que implica la soberanía. Maya Lennon, de la organización escocesa Mujeres por la Independencia. En tercer lugar, Antonia Luciani, que también es secretaria general de la Fundación Copiters, pero hoy nos hablará desde Córcega en nombre de la revista Arriti para transmitirnos una experiencia de más de 50 años de una publicación que, como otras, como Embata, de Pepe Bretón, Nos y tantas otras, insisten en darle voz propia a las naciones sin Estado. Y por último, por su actualidad, quisimos contar con una referencia paradigmática de los conflictos de soberanía en el seno de los Estados europeos. Porque, eh, desgraciadamente, el Brexit agitó las aguas continentales y ha llevado de nuevo la atención al viejo conflicto irlandés. Para hablarnos de ello, tenemos también con nosotros a Anthony Suárez, del Centro de Estudios Transfronterizos en Irlanda del Norte. A todos ellos, a todos vosotros y vosotras, os iré dando la palabra para unas intervenciones breves de unos siete minutos, para las que os pido también ya de entrada una opinión sobre el interés que veis en lo que se plantea en esta conferencia en la que estamos celebrando este debate, es decir, llegar a contar con un instrumento un código de buenas prácticas para la gestión democrática de los conflictos territoriales de soberanía. Así que, sin más, muchas gracias. Y tiene la palabra David Hicks, de la Red Europea por la Igualdad de las Lenguas. Um, ok, thank you, Keisho, everybody. Um, thank you very much for um, the great introduction, Xavier. I'd just uh, like to be thanked for um, Co Peters Foundation and the organizers for. Uh, inviting me to talk here about language rights and its com um, contribution to conflict resolution. Um, just firstly, I'm going to talk about Ellen a bit, the current language rights legal framework, domestic legislation, the problems with that, you know, how, what, you know, what the problems we're going up against, language rights and conflict resolution, some examples with Irish and Kosovo, um, Ellen recommendations, things like the Donnersteer Protocol, Um, working towards a code of best practices, you know, the overarching aim of the conference, and how I think um, language rights are central 
to successful conflict resolution, you know, when we, when we have um, separate languages there. Now, first of all, Ellen, you know, if you don't know us, the European Language Equality Network, we were set up and replaced in the Bureau in 2012. Currently, you have 46, represent 46 languages, 166 member organizations in 23 states. And we work to protect and promote our languages with the overarching aims to ensure that our members, you know, we, that we can live our lives in our languages. Now, we have two main pillars to our work, advocacy work and project work. Um, now, with like, the current language rights framework, um, we have domestic le legislation, Catalan, Welsh, Gaelic, Basque, Galician, for example, um, all quite effective. Um, and then we have the international instruments of the, you know, things like the Council of Europe, the Charter of Regional Minority Languages, the Framework Convention, the Convention on Human Rights. At the UN level, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and at the EU, Charter of Fundamental Rights, notably Article 21. And then things like the OSCE recommendations, which kind of have evolved from these. Now, with the things like the Charter, yeah, I mean, it's you know, kind of been quite successful in ways since it was done in the 1990s. So they've boosted the recognition and status of our languages and given the framework for state states to work on to protect um, I, you know, regional minority languages, for want of a better word. Now, um, but, you know, we have problems um, with this. And this is to talk about this framework, you know, what we can do, where we're moving towards. Um, if we take the Council of Europe, the Charter of Regional Minority Language and the Framework Convention, we still have the state's impunity if there's a violation of a treaty. With the Charter, um, we have this lack of or poor implementation. One of the biggest things we have is that some states haven't even ratified the Charter, for example, France, um, and also Greece and also Italy. Um, um, and this is a huge problem because they're just not moving forward. And this was something done in the 1990s. It's now 2020. Um, we have also with the Charter in itself doesn't actually provide any language rights. We have the ambiguous wording of the Framework Convention, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, with the EU, we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but this and this prohibits language discrimination. Very good, but this only applies when European law is being implemented. The Lisbon Treaty, well, that says respect for linguistic diversity, but what does that mean? Um, the trouble is, states reserve um, have the competence for language policy only, so it's reserved for them. So you know, there's all these problems. If we look at the Framework Convention, um, for example, um, um, in a, an example of ambiguous wording, Article 14, in areas inhabited by persons belonging to national minorities traditionally or in substantial numbers, if there is sufficient demand, what does that mean? The parties shall endeavour to ensure, what does that mean? Um, as far as possible, what does that mean? Um, and within the framework of their education systems, that persons belonging to those minorities have adequate what does that mean? Opportunities of being taught the minority language or receiving instruction in this language. There's so many get out clauses in that that the government has that it's not really clear how this clause can be described as providing a right to um, regional minority language education. So that, in, the, in a nutshell, gives you an example of, of how the framework really needs to be improved. Now, Let's go on to language rights and conflict resolution. Well, clearly, at the moment, um, they are providing, the, helping with the conflict resolution. Look at Irish. Um, in the north of Ireland, the six counties, the promise of an Irish Language Act has contribu contributed to the peace process. The Good Friday Agreement of 1998, the St Andrews Agreement of 2006, with a promise of an Irish Language Act. And now, since January 2020, the current proposals not quite the standalone Irish language act we were working for, but official status for the Irish language, bilingual signage on main roads and shared spaces, a language commissioner, public services in the Irish language community, and the right to use Irish in court. So again, you can see this, there's this link of language rights contributing to actual conflict resolution. If we also look at Kosovo, um, there's the law on the use of languages for 2006. And this is very interesting because we had it made um, Serbian and Albanian both having equal status. 
but with Albanian, 95%, 90% of speakers, Serbian, around 5% of speakers. So you can imagine, you know, what happens if with France ever make Breton, you know, co you know, like with the equal status. So, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, as an example of how, um, as, you know, it's, uh, of language rights helping with conflict resolution. Now, if we go like just to kind of, we've only got a short amount of time, but, you know, with our recommendations, um, and working towards this code of best practices that are being talked about here. Um, we always think that domestic language legislation is the best way to go at the moment. You know, Welsh Language Act, Catalan Language Planning Acts, the Catalan Language Acts. You know, this is the, this is the being seen the progress and every language that's got some language legislation like that has seen its numbers grow, is more secure in, in its environment. Languages like Breton and Corsican still do not have this legislation which underpins their progress. And this is, you know, we must have that to have effective re revitalization. We can't plan without it. And we would always say it would be good to have a language commissioner as well to ensure those rights. We're also working, you know, what we're calling for is an EU regulation on minoritized language rights with, a, with an EU languages commissioner to ensure those rights. You know, long-term project, very difficult to get. Also, you know, there was the Endangered Languages Report that came from the European Parliament. That needs to be enacted as well. You know, like Antonio works on that. You know, Francois Alfonsi, he, he was the uh, rapporteur for that. Um, also, we want to see the, the, the full Im implementation of the existing treaties. You know, still, again, the Charter, very good, but it's just not being implemented properly, let alone people not even ratifying it. And then these are 1990s treaties, and we know much more. Um, about revitalization, how it's going to be effective. And now it's 2020 and we think, you know, we should be working towards something, you know, which much more reflects our state of knowledge today. So in 2016, we had the Donostia Protocol, which is like for us, the new standard setting tool for ensuring language rights. This was written by civil society from across Europe. Um, it had a huge amount of input. Um, and, um, you know, it was put together in the Basque Country by Concilio, about Paul Bourbel, um, leading on it. And, and we see this very much as the new standard setting tool for language rights and where we're going. So, you know, to sum it up, then we, we think it's vital, you know, when languages are involved, that there's a language dimension um, that it's recognised if there's, you know, in any kind of uh, conflict. Look at the language dimension is the one. Um, and then deal with it, you know, with these tools. And then we see language rights being as being successful to successful um, conflict resolution. And then, you know, for us, you know, in the sort of longer term of the bigger picture, we do see language discrimination, this ongoing thing in 2020. It's a form of racism. Um, it's a form of discrimination against people. Um, you know, why is this still going on? It's unacceptable. Um, and you can understand, you know, that you, you get this um, call for autonomy or independence. Um, it's a ground for separation. Um, this is what's going to happen. And I think all states, you know, especially the nation states like Britain, France, um, Spain, that, you know, contains countries that contains nations. They need to be much more aware of this, um, you know, and, and deal with it. And make sure there's some kind of dealing, you know, dealing with it um, in terms of conflict resolution and uh, satisfactory language rights um, for the speakers of our language. So just to open, um, thank you very much. And Mraz Braz, Eskere Kasko. Eh, thank you very much, eh, David. Gracias. Eh, eh, y por ajustarse también al tiempo. Tiene la palabra la Fundación Maggie Lennon, de la Organización Mujeres por la Independencia de Escocia. Adelante. Uh, good, uh, good evening, good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? Okay, so I'm to talk about the role of social movements as actors for civic, um, democratic and peaceful change. And I'm going to talk about the role that Women for Independence had in the Scottish uh, referendum uh, on how we change the narrative and how we continue to change the narrative. Um, it's not always easy to do that within a referendum situation because referenda are, by their nature, binary. And as a result, they are divisive and they are primed for conflict. 
but it doesn't have to always be so. And when the UK government agreed to legislate for the Scottish referendum in 2012, the Scottish government actually wanted a third option on the ballot, not just yes, not just no, but one for a greater um, extension of powers from Westminster to Scotland. And it was rejected out of hand by the UK government. And so the die was cast for the rancor and the division that followed. Things have changed since 2014. The betrayal of the promises made to Scotland by the unionist parties about extra powers, the fact that 66% of Scots voted to remain in the EU and we are being removed from the union without any concessions whatsoever, and the increasingly aggressive and conflict-ridden attitude of the Westminster government that even if there is proof of a democratic desire for independence or a vote on independence, which the polls are showing and which we believe will be evident in the result of the Scottish general elections next May, they say they will not sanction a legal referendum. This is all turning people towards yes. And as a result, it's very unlikely the Scottish government would even consider a third option on the ballot. So born out of a country driven by division and uh, facing that again, how did Women for India and how do we continue to change the narrative? Um, it's important you understand that in Scotland, the case for independence was largely framed in terms of social justice. What made the Scottish campaign so unusual is that it is not framed in the conventional terms of nationalism or ethnic exceptionalism. It was and remains a question about national sovereignty addressed as an issue of social change. And because it was um, couched in those terms, that's what engaged people. 97% of the adult population registered to vote in September 2014, and the turnout was 85%, which is the highest since the introduction of universal adult suffrage. That was despite the fact the press and mainstream media was universally hostile to independence, but it didn't actually matter, because as it got nearer the ballot, the grassroots movement that Women for Independence was part of was gathering strength. It's because our arguments were positive and we went under the radar of the negative Better Together campaign and its press transmitters. So Women for Independence was part of this mass grassroots movement that was across the country in geographical centres. Every sector of society, every social group within society had its independence supporting movement. As feminists, we know that there's no part of life or policy that is not without a gender perspective, and that clearly included the prospect of independence. So we were founded entirely to make sure that women's voices and interests were given a fair consideration on that journey. Our message was that it was only independence that would give us the full powers needed to drive the aims of a socially just nation, and one which would promote at its centre the rights and roles of women and girls, and that that was the best way to realise the hopes and dreams of ourselves, our families and our communities. We believe that that is a unifying aim for women, irrespective of their, of their politics. And that was on the basis that we had our conversations. What was the best way to achieve that? Women for Independence champion the fact that we do politics differently. But what does that actually mean? Women were telling us constantly that they were turned off by male-dominated branch meetings of traditional party political uh, of traditional party politics. They were often isolated from that, from engagement through geography or transport or lack of childcare. Much of the early part of the Yes campaign was formed by what we call shouty men, and the tendency to focus on large public gatherings, waving flags in people's fa in faces, and to say, let's get independence done and think about the details later. Women were not impressed by having flags waved in their face and wanted the detail discussed now. So we also appeal to a demographic of women that is largely invisible to politicians, and that's women between the ages of 40 and 60. In the early days of the campaign, the debates were all about procedure and timing and process, and women on the whole being time poor and um, playing multiple roles have no patience for that. They wanted to debate policy issues, they wanted to debate, to debate solutions, they wanted to debate change, and that was what we did. Women's voices were front and central in safe spaces during our campaign. 
and we began to promote women into public life. And we have a huge number of present and past national committee members who are now elected representatives locally and nationally, including two government ministers. And this has spilled out to the wider membership. We didn't accuse women who asked questions of being of running down Scotland, which was what tended to happen generally in the campaign. We were respectful to people who disagreed with us. We didn't call them stupid. And we challenged myths. The main myth is that women voted no because they're risk averse. There's actually no evidence whatsoever that women are more risk averse than men. It's just that the things that women worry about more are the things in the campaign, the big ticket issues, which weren't well explained. And mostly the economy, both microeconomy and macroeconomy, and when that economy goes wrong, that's when women worry because women are more affected by austerity and poverty. They're more vulnerable in the labour market, being overrepresented in low paid, unskilled, part time and insecure jobs. We conducted research that told us women get their information differently, not from mainstream media, literally because they don't have time to sit down and watch the news in the evening. They get it more from peers, from other women, from sources they trust, older women, aunts, mothers, younger women, their children, which tells us then that women have potential to be influencers of, influencers of other women. So we tapped into that. Now, other things are driving people towards independence and other things are driving women towards independence. The very strong performance of our female first minister over COVID, in stark contrast to the buffoon Boris Johnson and his blustering, is showing women that it's possible for a woman to stand up in public against hostile, mostly male media and win the day. And the other key thing for us is that we didn't go away in 2014 and we have been active in policy influencing campaigning ever since. Much of what we've campaigned for has been picked up and supported by cross party, including unionist parties, and is now law or forming part of manifestos. And that's particularly in areas of prison reform for women, menstrual health, period poverty, uh, sustainable food production, land reform, rural poverty, transport, domestic violence. So Women for Independence have a strong record, which we'll be building on. We come back to the premise that what unites us as women is more important than what divides us. If you get policy right for 52% of the population, after all, you get it right for society. And we have consistently shifted the narrative from a binary confrontational message to something more solution focused and more nuanced. We ask women, if the current constitutional arrangement is selling you short as women, why not consider an alternative? Or better, why not help build that alternative? And it's working, because in 2014, the vast majority of women voted no to independence. The last poll to come out two weeks ago showed that now 55% of women would vote yes. So that gender gap seems to have gone. And although Women for Independence can't take all the credit for it, it is clear that our message of hope and change and what we've been promoting is finding a wider audience. I'm not naive enough to think the next campaign won't be divisive and that shouty men with flags will disappear. But I am convinced that Women for India is part of that grassroots movement, which engaged and empowered a nation to be so involved in one of the biggest questions have faced us, that that will bring more women into the debate, more women's voices into the debate, and as a result, the debate will be richer and more nuanced. And I hope it encourages women to find their voice, to find their place, to become organised, to develop skills that they didn't know they had, and to continue to take part in public life. And ultimately, I hope that it's women that bring us home the gift of independence, and that that will be rewarded with a place back in the European family. Um, Thank you. Hello, dear colleagues, partner, and our friends from uh, Bilbao. I'm delighted to be taking part in this uh, important discussion today. So, uh, as uh, Xavier said, I'm the Secretary General of Computers Foundation and as well a uh, representative of the Corsican uh, weekly newspaper, uh, Ariti, and both of which are committed to promoting peace. 
Uh, indeed, Flemish politician Moritz Kopeters, uh, whose name was given to our foundation, was a strong promoter of uh, non-violence and intercultural dialogue in Europe. And Ariti, as a militant and uh, deeply pro-European newspaper, is also committed to this principle. So the event uh, held today is a crucial important because uh, the last years have seen a surge in violence uh, over sovereignty issues in Europe. Uh, no later than two months ago, the Azerbaijani army and its Turkey ally uh, have initiated attacks against the Armenian people <clears throat> of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, and this is uh, a perfect illustration. Uh, we find ourselves now in a context of redefinition of what sovereignty means in Europe. It is therefore time for a new methodology to solve conflicts. Um, one that uh, should fully embrace and conform the European values and break away from the oversimplified concept of uh, nation states as understood across uh, the 19th and 20th uh, century. I also believe that such a methodology will strengthen the links and rebuild trust between European citizens and their governing institutions at a time when it's uh, much needed. Indeed, today we see citizens all over Europe expressing their distress for their governments and frustration with the measure they are taking to tackle the current pandemic. A new breath is needed in order to rebuild a more uh, meaningful dialogue between European citizens and those, those who uh, govern them. Media, and especially minority media, can play a crucial role in this work. Newspapers like, like uh, Ariti bring to the four new ideas, but also representations of diverse identity, languages, culture, which is vital to the plural, plurality uh, of Europeanness. Such media connect European issues with all citizens over the continent, allowing a better uh, outreach and shedding light on how Europe impacts on these uh, citizens' daily lives. As uh, underlined by Basque journalist Pilar uh, Calzada, uh, quote, in dark times of economic downturn, conflict, climate change, poverty, and inequality, people need hope, and journalism has the potential to provide it. Stories told with style, as well as respecting press freedom and diversity, can help people better understand the complex world in which we live. I stand by these words. My firm belief is that improved communication on diversity, on dialogue across our continent is crucial, especially when it comes to preserving peace. If media outlets fail to show how complex and diverse our societies are, or worse, fuel misrepresentations of others when social, then social distance between groups of population increases, which in turn can lead to tensions. This topic is especially relevant this year, when the 13th session of the United Nations Forum on Minority Issues is convened on the theme of hate speech, social media and minorities. Online hate speech and discrimination can lead to violence or the, exasp the exacerbation thereof. In context of conflicts, negative stereotypes against vulnerable, vulnerable groups are often exacerbated and may lead to violence and even atrocity crimes. This was, uh, this was best exemplified uh, as you might know, <clears throat> during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, when a radio station was instrumentalized for propaganda, inciting the violence and using deshumanizing language to speak about the Tutsi. With this in mind, independent and pluralistic media landscapes are crucial to ensure social cohesion and peace. 
there need uh, to be enough media outlets to give everyone a voice and those need to be fully independent from state's control. As Europeans, we want to avoid a situation like uh, that of Hong Kong in this regard. According to Reporters Without uh, Borders, this territory has, has seen numerous cases uh, of violence against the media during the pro-democracy uh, demonstration in, um, in 2019. Press freedom, it is a red threat uh, as a result of pressure from Beijing. So to wrap, to wrap up, I, I will say that uh, when thinking about a methodology to solve conflict, it seems crucial to make sure speeches he heard in public spaces are informed and balanced. The media can help uh, with that by telling their research base through in all independence and fairness and provide space for alternative voices and view. This is why uh, um, this is what Ariti uh, strives to do on a weekly basis since uh, 8 December 1966. Uh, our governing institutions also have their role to play uh, through the launching of public awareness campaigns uh, to encourage inclusive societies comprised of diverse cultural languages and religions in order to counter uh, to counter hate speech and intolerance. Thank you. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, Antonia. Eh, damos entonces, para terminar esta primera ronda, la palabra a Anthony Suárez desde Irlanda del Norte. Obrigado, Xavier. Thank you, Xavier. And, and thank you to the Corpitas Foundation for inviting me to take part in this uh, roundtable, uh, which is exploring a very important theme or themes, uh, issues, issues that are very alive from where I am speaking to you from this evening, which is I, 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 I live in Belfast in Northern Ireland. I'm the director of the Centre for Cross-Border Studies, which is actually based in Armagh, which is uh, a city, officially a city, although when you see the size of it, um, you'd laugh when you see it. it's actually a town, but it's a town near the border with the Republic of Ireland. Um, so the issues that we're talking about discussing here tonight are, are issues that are very alive here on the island of Ireland, um, particularly, of course, in the context of the United Kingdom's decision to leave the European Union and what that means, it, 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 particularly for, for Northern Ireland and for the island of Ireland. But I, I want to actually go back a few years to, we're talking about frameworks and frameworks and, and legal frameworks in terms of conflict resolution and also in terms of what that might say about the right to self-determination. And f for my organization, the Center for Cross-Border Studies, one of the things that we are ruled by, uh, and my organization was created in 1999, And since then, one of one of the the, the kind of the policy um, pillars that it is it's abided by was continues to be the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which was reached in 1998, which was the agreement that brought to an end decades of a conflict that took thousands of lives, injured tens of thousands um, uh, in Northern Ireland. But it's a conflict that we mustn't forget that spanned, it wasn't what wasn't limited to Northern Ireland, it wasn't limited, limited to the island of Ireland. It's a conflict actually spread beyond the island of Ireland. It, it touched people and, 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 and took lives and, and, and scarred people in Great Britain, in other places, in Gibraltar, other places in Europe. So it's not, a, we have to remember, it's not a conflict. Obviously the, the heart of it was in Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland, but it's one that spans spans uh, borders. But that agreement that was reached back in 1998, I, I just want to note a couple of things about it. It's an agreement that actually has three central parts to it. And again, this, this goes back to this issue around um, going beyond borders. The Good Friday Agreement has three core parts to it. The first part 
is the part focusing specifically on Northern Ireland and on democratic uh, power sharing institutions. The second element or strand two of the agreement deals with the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and creates specific institutions uh, to, to enshrine th those relations between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And there's a third element, core element to it, which is the one that sets a framework for relations between the island of Ireland and Great Britain. And that brings together all of the governments, the government in Belfast, the government in Dublin, the government in Edinburgh, the government in Cardiff, the government in London, as well as the governments of the Isle of Man of the Channel Islands. So it is what we call the east-west dimension of that agreement. So uh, what I want to, to, to emphasize is that the agreement, it was a, an agreement that brought to an end a conflict. The focus was Northern Ireland, but spanned beyond Northern Ireland. But it is an agreement that actually brings together the islands, uh, the island of Ireland and, 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 and Great Britain into, 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 into this particular agreement. The agreement was reached on the 10th of April of 1998. But it was an agreement that was actually, we, we've mentioned referendums tonight on several occasions. Well, this agreement of 1998 was actually approved in two referendums, one in Northern Ireland and a simultaneous one in the Republic of Ireland, which took place on the 22nd of May of 1998. And just so you know, 71.1% in Northern Ireland voted in favour of the Good Friday Agreement and 94.4% of people in the Republic of Ireland voted yes. So on both sides of the border of the island of Ireland, people voted for this, this agreement. I would again want to highlight here an aspect perhaps that maybe it's something that, 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 that it's a gap that perhaps is, is being highlighted now because of Brexit. There was a, a referendum on that agreement in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, it's agreement that actually brings together the governments of across the islands, but there was no referendum in Scotland or Wales or England in terms of what do people think about the agreement, the, the Good Friday Agreement in, in Great Britain, but that's perhaps um, beside the point for now. But I would also like to emphasise that that agreement approved by the people of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is an international agreement with the governments of Ireland and the UK being its co-guarantors, it's lodged in the United Nations, so it's in an international agreement under international law. And I want to come back to that. So an international agreement that brings to an end a, a, a conflict or, or, or a resolution to a conflict um, in, in, on the island of Ireland. Let's quickly move forward to 2016 and another referendum. The referendum on the UK's uh, withdrawal from the European Union. And just to remind people, and I know, I know most people will be aware of that, although the UK as a whole voted to leave the European Union, Northern Ireland didn't vote to leave. Northern Ireland, the people of Northern Ireland, the, the result was a vote to remain as it was in Scotland as well. Although Scotland, actually, that the percentage was, much, was higher than in Northern Ireland. In Scotland, it was 62% in favour of remaining in the European Union. In Northern Ireland, it was 56%. Um, but here again, we've got the question of who is voting? The, whose voice are we hearing in, the, in, the, in, these, in these votes? Uh, and whose voices are being heard? Um, in terms of the, of the decisions being made and then how those in, uh, it, uh, decisions influence policy. Um, one of the things that, uh, and I'm just speaking here in generalities, and we can get into the detail later, perhaps in the, in the discussions. European Union membership, which is common to the UK and to the Republic of Ireland, meant that the question of identity in Northern Ireland, whether you identified yourself as British or Irish, it, 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 it's not that it was uh, obliterated or, or, or was no longer a point of contention, but it was it was one that was given a different space. The European space gave a different dimension to this question of identity and sovereignty that Brexit has put firmly back in place. The, this question of identity, who do you identify as, and does the identi identity 
um, relate to territory, to sovereignty. And I'm just going to very quickly remind people of something in terms of the, the, the self-determination. Going back again to the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 that brought to an end the decades of conflict. Now, I, I, I'm just, I'm sorry to do this, but I think it's important. I'm just going to very, very briefly, it's a short, short quote. I'm going to read directly from the Good Friday Agreement um, and what it says about the right of self-determination. So, the, the parties to the agreement, and here I quote directly, recognize that it is for the people of the island of Ireland alone, by agreement between the two parts respectively, and without external impediment, to exercise their right of self-determination on the basis of consent, freely and concurrently given, north and south, to bring about a united Ireland, if that is their wish, accepting that this right must be achieved and exercised with and subject to the agreement and consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. This is what the Good Friday Agreement that the party signed up to says about self-determination and the prospect of a united Ireland. It, it, it is something that is a right of people to, 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 to look to achieve. It is something that can only be achieved, however, with the agreement and consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. But it is written into the Good Friday Agreement. And just another element in terms of that agreement, that 1998 agreement, and how it gave us a framework that brought an end to uh, decades of conflict, it also has something very important to say around identity. And here, this I am, uh, I'm going to again quickly re read uh, from the agreement itself. It's actually from the Good Friday Agreement, it's actually two agreements. It's, it's an agreement between the, the political parties in Northern Ireland, but it's also a British Irish agreement between the two governments of Britain and uh, or the, the UK and, and the Republic of Ireland. So, this part is actually from that uh, British Irish agreement. And it says this. The two parties, the British and Irish governments, recognise the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland to ident identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may so choose, and accordingly confirm that their right to hold both British and Irish citizenship is accepted by both governments and would not be affected by any future change in the status of Northern Ireland. So that, that, that international agreement says something about identity as well, how people of Northern Ireland identify themselves as Irish or British or both, if they so wish. And that right to identify yourself as Irish or British continues no matter what the future of the constitutional status of Northern Ireland is. So if Northern Ireland wants to become part of a united Ireland in the future, that right to identify yourself as British will continue in future. But here I come to my conclusion. It's an international agreement, it's international law. But very recently, uh, I'm sure many people would be aware, uh, in, the, in Westminster, in, in, in the, so this is back in the UK, in Westminster, we had a government minister uh, on the floor of the House of Commons in a debate. And it just so happened that that minister was actually the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. So the UK government minister responsible for Northern Ireland was asked a question following the of what is known as the uh, Internal Market Bill, where he was asked about international law and in terms of this Internal Market Bill. And he confessed that that Internal Market Bill will break international law in a very specific and limited way. So this is a government minister accepting that they are introducing legislation that will or has the potential of going against international law. Now, why am I saying this? And this is, in, this is all in the context of Brexit. This is all in the context of introducing legislation because of Brexit. And this uh, acceptance that this particular piece of legislation can break international law, it means that there is now a, a lack of trust. So if there is a confession that we are, the UK government is prepared to break international law in this area because of Brexit, what is to stop it from breaking international law in respect of the Good Friday Agreement, which is an international agreement, it's international law. That, so that's one element. 
the other thing it was actually David Hicks referred to when he was talking about languages and he referred to an Irish language act. These great illegal frameworks in terms of uh, uh, conflict resolution, they, they represent potential, but they're not any good unless what they say, these agreements are actually then put into domestic law. So you might have an international agreement, but unless you then enact it in domestic law, then you know there, 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 there is there there are there are, are, are problems there and that's one of the problems we've had with elements of 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 the good friday agreement and my final two points in terms of conflict resolution there is a, this 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 we have to achieve a good balance between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law we sometimes have a tendency of of people political elites or, or political parties to just abide by the letter of a law. Um, well, when you're talking about conflict resolution, which is a dynamic process, sometimes what you need is the spirit of the law, not just the letter, it's the spirit. What is behind what that law, why that law was actually written in the first place. So there's there's this need also for the spirit of the law and common ownership. There's the, the most perfect laws like the Good Friday Agreement, will lack power, will lack, lack effectiveness if they're not commonly owned by the people to whom, the, 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 where the conflict is supposed to be being resolved. And that is another element of the Good Friday Agreement. It has lots of potential, but we need that common ownership and we need that put into domestic law. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, tenemos muy poco tiempo porque creo que el, el momento de terminar sería eh, a las siete, o sea, nos quedan ocho minutos. Entonces yo eh, recogería una pregunta eh, que daría para hablar seguramente mucho tiempo, que, que es la que se ha planteado, que hacía referencia en relación a unas cosas comentadas por Mario, por Antonia, eh, digamos, hacía referencia a si se puede eh, la, digamos, el papel de los medios de comunicación sectarios o de las políticas populistas, cómo pueden influir en este tipo de cuestiones, porque es verdad que eh, Europa tiene muchos retos y también tiene el reto de hacerle frente a ese tipo de, de políticas y a ese tipo de, de, de medios de comunicación que pretenden dividir o, digamos, enrarecer más aún el, el ambiente, ¿no? como, según también se hizo referencia en una situación, sobre todo, como la de la crisis sanitaria. ¿no? Me alegro, en última instancia, también de que Andrés Suárez haya hecho referencia a lo que yo decía también, que era un, un, un marco paradigmático en cuanto a resolución de conflictos, y a los pros y contras y los problemas que también se plantean, incluso cuando hay un, un buen acuerdo, y yo creo que esa también puede ser una, una buena, un buen aprendizaje para lo que se va a dar estos días. En todo caso, yo os daría eh, pues, un último turno de un minuto por si queréis eh, hacer una última intervención de cierre. Podemos hacerlo por el mismo orden, si os parece. David. Uh, well, I'm an ex-journalist, and as a result of that, I absolutely reject the idea that the media reflects <clears throat> public opinion, the media shapes public opinion, and the media does that to the agenda of others. And the first thing that people have to do is ask whose agenda that is. And for example, the creation of Fox News in the United States couldn't be more obvious of that. And in fact, everything that's come out of Rupert Murdoch stable. I often answer this question by saying, there was a time when if you went to church, You listened to the mass in Latin, even though you didn't speak Latin. And that was the church's way of controlling you, of telling you what to think and what would happen to you. And why did that stop? That stopped because there was a point when people said, I want to know myself. I don't trust this. Now, it's exactly that that needs to happen. People need to understand their voices matter, their voices count, even if their voice is unique or sectorial or represents a small bit of society. And what that needs are things like social movements to say, we will help you make that voice count. We will help you challenge and say, I don't believe you. I always think um, 
The answer to anything to do with power, and this question is essentially about power, is follow the money. It's what Tony Benn used to say. Ask who has the power? What did they do with the power? Where did they get the power? On whose, in whose benefit is that power wielded? And more importantly, how can we take that power from people? And I think that is absolutely it. People have to trust that their own voices matter. And the whole demonization of the other, whether that's the person with the other point of view or the demonization of people who are different from you, who become a target for hatred, needs to stop. And that takes courage and it does take strong social movement leaders to do that. Now, it's a bit of a, maybe I'm talking about unicorns and maybe it's, it's fanciful, but there's no other way to do it. But come back to that thought about the church. There was a time you had no idea what you were being told on a Sunday, and that isn't the case now. It took a long time, but it, ultimately it worked. Okay. Um, yeah. My like, conclusion comments, you know, with this um, like fascinating topic of this conference, very timely um, topic of this conference is how can we in Europe still today, um, when we're sort of looking at um, you know, working towards gender equality, um, racial equality, and that we still have this language inequality. How it, can it be that Catalans at an airport get beaten up by Spanish policemen for speaking Catalan? Um, you know, children get discriminated against in the Basque country for like using Basque or um, in the French state, you know, the leader in human rights. They still haven't even ratified an, an old 1990s uh, charter for regional languages. You know, it's a disgrace. How can it carry on like this? Um, and this is why it's so important that we work towards getting some kind of um, thing for um, our languages, because you can't carry on discriminating against people's languages it's like discriminating against their core being um we've seen it happen already uh, with gallic you know discriminated to the point that it's uh, um, almost disappeared yes now there's some um, movements for these things for it to be uh, to come back but uh, you know the, the, there was like the clearances and that and everybody had to you know they were kind of cleared out and it's just you know this mindset of uh, discriminating on the grounds of language you know it's got to change along with the other discriminations but with language uh, discrimination it's still like the kind of uh, you know kind of late at the party of the other human rights so that would be my concluding comments you know if you're going to have conflict resolution it's like when there's language involved it's central and it's got to be included in there thank you uh, and on that, and actually going back to what Maggie was saying, actually what David was relating to there as well, for conflict resolution, we it's also being aware of power structures. Uh, going back to the context of where I'm in now, which is you know Northern Ireland is part of a United Kingdom, which is made up of constituent elements. Let's just say, I'll use an example, a very recent example, which relates to COVID. And just gives you a, an idea of, of of who's speaking, who's who's heard, and who makes decisions. So, Northern Ireland, I'll just speak for uh, about Northern Ireland for the moment, uh, has been in kind of a I mean, lockdown for qu quite a while now. Um, but there was no real support coming from the UK government in terms of those people who were were not working until. The English government, so let's, sorry, the, the UK Prime Minister decided that, 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 that England was going to go into lockdown and then all of a sudden the supports were there for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales in terms of those who were not, not able to work, they've been sent home, uh, couldn't work because of coronavirus. So it's, we all have the same problem, but the, it's only really recognised as a problem when it hits one particular place uh, and, and then, and then all of a sudden, it's recognised as a problem. Um, so it's, it's it's again making sure that all voices are heard and all voices are recognised, and uh, and the problem is a problem that's recognised uh, at all times, not just a particular time when it hits a particular element of a population. So that that's what I would f finish with. So my conclusion as well is that uh, with Ariti, we are trying to uh, give a voice 
uh, a different voice because, uh, as you know, in, in France, uh, the mainstream media uh, is completely on the same line as the, the French government, which is that there is only one state, one people, one language, no diversity, no territories, and no other people, and indeed no possible recognition of other uh, people as the Corsican people living uh, in, 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 in this territory. So for us, Ariti is as well a, a way uh, to, to promote this kind of idea and to, to tell, as Maggie said, to people, think differently, be free to think what you want to, 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 uh, to think. And if it's against the, the mainstream uh, media and the, 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 the main ideas uh, promoted by the government, uh, there is a way uh, and, and we can be uh, together um, and, and share different way to think and to live and we have to respect that and to encourage all the way like media and other way uh, to promote this uh, this freedom thank you eh, muchas gracias Antonia eh, creo que debemos que terminar no sé si si tenemos eh, eh, al otro lado también algunos de los organizadores en todo caso hubo aquí una pregunta que se la voy a lanzar eh, para que la conteste en segundos, es una pregunta sencilla que nos hacía eh, Xavier Cintibarrena, que era para Anthony, si era, eh, consideraba que ya por el contexto de Brexit, eh, digamos, se daban las condiciones para una potencial reunificación de Irlanda dentro de la Unión Europea. Very quickly, I just thought I'd that in ten. Very quickly, this was actually uh, the pre not one of the previous Irish Prime Ministers or Taoiseachs during the negotiations actually managed, the Commission agreed to that. If there was to be a reunification, then, then Northern Ireland would automatically become part of, of, of the European Union. So different from Scotland, where I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that question is still to be resolved, but the European Commission has already agreed to that in terms of if, if there were to be a United Ireland, then we, got, we would be part of the European Union again. It's, it, um, it, was, it was interesting to see what Joe Biden was saying about how much he supports Good Friday Agreement. You know, very strong comments. Um, you know, I don't know if you had any comment about that. I found that very interesting when he got elected. You know, we were going back looking at his comments in September about any threat to the Good Friday Agreement, um, you know, backing it up totally. I don't, oh, I, what did you think about that? Just on that, well, I, I think what is really interesting is, is the, I think it was today, Time, time is now a stretchy element. I think it was today that there was the phone calls from the president to both Boris Johnson and to the Irish Taoiseach, Michal Martin. But Joe Biden's readout published after the conversation mentions him telling Boris Johnson that he values the Good Friday Agreement. Boris Johnson's readout of that, so the published readout after the telephone call did not mention the Good Friday Agreement. So Joe Biden's published statement says Good Friday Agreement, Boris Johnson does not mention the Good Friday Agreement at all. So that, that tells you something. I'd, I'd just like to pick up on something that Anthony said. There is, of course, mm -hmm. precedent for knowing, for the EU knowing how to deal with a, 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 a reunification because they had it with Germany. There is no precedent for a country that secedes from another country that is, as a whole, was part of the EU. And the last time I spoke at the Capetius Foundation when I was in Brussels, that was one of the asks that I had, was that there needs to be a roadmap for that, so that when people are voting, they know what the outcome is going to be. And it's not, it is absolutely not acceptable that people within the Commission, without really any knowledge, make ridiculous statements about who can and can't join because that changed the vote in Scotland in, in, in their independence referendum. There's no doubt about that. Bueno, eh, podríamos seguir relacionamente porque es un tema de, de gran interés, pero eh, nuestro tiempo se ha acabado. Entonces, querría agradeceros a todos, eh, Maggie, David. Antonio y Anthony, vuestra participación, vuestras aportaciones. Espero también que para la conferencia la, la aportación de esta mesa de debate haya sido de interés. Y nos queda eh, desearles a todas las personas que van a trabajar en los próximos días en, en darle forma y presentar esas bases para 
eh, tener una guía de buenas prácticas para la resolución de conflictos territoriales dentro de los Estados europeos tengan éxito porque ello nos va, en buena medida, a la mejora del futuro de todas nuestras naciones y pueblos en Estado. Le agradezco nuevamente a los organizadores propiciar nuestra participación y eh, esperemos que en el futuro, y sobre todo a poder ser físicamente, nos podamos volver a encontrar para seguir hablando. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Muchas gracias, Xavier. Es que ricasco gusti hoy. E, gaurkos, isten dugu saioa, baina ahora tú. Biar gehiago dakagu, eta biar oso oso egun interesgarriare dakagu. Mesedes, conecta tu saiteste, eta gonbida tu suen lagunei conecta cera. Eta bisu bat, aos aos abaltzeko, bisi bisi abaltzeko, begira tu spam carpetak, em, Archivo hauek, mesu hauek, peti eskutatzen dira, nahi ez ditugun karpeta hoietan. Mirar, buscar en los archivos de spam, porque por ahí llegan todos los enlaces de este sistema. Abrirlo a vuestras personas conocidas. Eta besterik ez, mila mila esker, gaur arratzaldean egurekin egoteagatik, entzule asko izan ditugu, konexioa mantendu duzue, bihar espero dugun goizeko beratxidetan, Verá si tardí etan, ver si seré en el carcea. Viarte. <tose>